We're also recording this. So you're gonna see that a, a recording has popped up. A lot of people can join us for these talks, but also a lot of people um, have other uh, obligations or engagements. So many of them ask if we will um, record them. And we do, we have a virtual library on the alumni and parents section on the website. I do encourage that you check that out, cmc.edu slash alumni. Click on virtual engagement on the main banner. You can, you can check out the virtual uh, library, which has a number of faculty and alumni talks to date. Uh, my name is Evan Rutter. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement at Claremont McKenna, also an alumnus of the college and thrilled to welcome all of you and very excited to have Professor Eric Helland uh, here from our economics department uh, with us and he is also very excited uh, to discuss uh, the opioid pandemic, the other pandemic uh, today. A few things about Zoom. Um, first at the bottom there is a chat and a participants feature. If you click the chat button, the chat will pop to the right You'll see a lot of people putting their name, class year, parent year, and location. Please do that. It's fun to see where everyone is from. And it looks like we have from Florida to New York, from to Chicago to Phoenix to Southern California and everything in between. Um, there's also in that chat feature later on when we do the Q&A, uh, I'll pull questions from the chat. So if you submit a question in the chat, I will ask it for you. Or you can virtually raise your hand. So in the participant section, if you click on that, uh, at the bottom of the list of names, you'll see raise your hand. If you raise your hand during the Q&A portion, I will unmute you and call on you and you can ask Professor Helen a deep, probing, difficult question because those are the best and those are his favorite. Um, and then on the top right, you'll see speaker view or grid view. If you click speaker view, that means you'll see pretty much just me right now with about five little boxes at the top. Uh, and if it's on speaker view, then uh, you can really focus on who's talking at the time. If it's on grid view, which is what I have right now, you'll actually see about 25 or 30 or 35 different squares. You can kind of see who's here and who's on video. And uh, it's kind of, uh, it's fun for me that way just to see what, uh, what everyone's up to. Um, as many of you know, uh, the college did uh, send our students home over an extended spring break, uh, and we are very excited to work and working hard uh, to return our students to Claremont in August. Um, and of course, a lot depends on Los Angeles County, uh, but we are very committed to an in-person return uh, as much as humanly possible um, in the fall. Of course, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of great people working very hard um, to make sure that happens. Uh, June 30 is the end of our fiscal year, and I do encourage you, if you haven't yet made a gift to the college, please consider either the Crisis Response Fund, the Alumni Fund, or the Parent Fund, and help support CMC um, and our students, most importantly, through these very difficult times. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure to bring uh, Professor Eric Helland, also a parent of the college. His daughter just graduated, uh, so he's a P20 as well. He's the William F. Podlick Professor of Economics and George R. Roberts Fellow, and he's co-director of the CMC Policy Lab. Eric, uh, the show is yours, and just so everyone knows, he is going to share a screen at one point. He has a number of slides, so if all of a sudden your screen changes, uh, that is completely normal. Eric. And, and your screen is about to change, so uh, let's, let's do a test. Did that work? Good to go. Uh, Evan, are we, uh, are we sharing? Looks good. All right. Um, and I'm going to do one other thing. Uh, um, as those of you who've had me in class know, I am constitutionally incapable of actually sitting down and talking. So apologies in advance, but uh, I'm going to pace around a little bit and I'll try to stay in the frame. Um, let, me, uh, let me talk just a little bit about um, kind of what this uh, particular project is. And then um, a little bit, I want to spend a little bit of time on the CMC Policy Lab. So I, I was um, trying to come up with a sort of catchy title uh, for this. Um, and what I came up with was the other pandemic, uh, opioid uh, litigation and the role of law uh, uh, in public health and public policy. Um, and basically, oh, let me get over here. Okay, why am I not advancing? There we go. There we go. So here's the basic sort of story behind this. Um, basically, the, there's a paper that... Um, uh, came out a couple of years ago that talked about something called deaths of despair. And the idea is that for the first time, uh, really in a very, very long time, for a category of U.S. citizens, life expectancy uh, has actually begun to decline. And so the, the puzzle here is that for sort of uh, men without a college education, kind of over uh, uh, 40, for the first time in a long time, uh, their life expectancy is actually getting shorter. And that's kind of unprecedented, right? That, that for most of, um, 
uh, U.S. history, life expectancy has sort of increased. It's increased uh, at different rates. It's different for different groups of people, but it has kind of always been going up. And so for the first time, it decreased. And one of the reasons seems to be uh, what the authors of this study uh, call deaths of despair. A lot of these are uh, overdoses on uh, drugs. And in particular, uh, opioids. And uh, Basically, between 2000 and 2018, opioids killed about 47,000 people. 32% um, of those deaths involved prescription opioids. Um, since most of us are kind of thinking uh, everything relative to COVID these days, the New York Times had a, uh, an article looking at kind of uh, uh, events that had increased the death rate um, short of, you know, sort of uh, a war. And, you know, the 1918 pandemic is up there as sort of one of the biggest increases in the death rates. Um, COVID in New York City and, and Italy is up there. This would be kind of in the middle of the pack for sort of the opioid epidemic. It's, it's, um, it really is in terms of the sort of number of deaths that it's increased. But as I'll talk about, that actually masks um, the fact that it has increased deaths in certain communities far more dramatically than it has overall. So um, most of these deaths are due to illegal drugs, something I want to come back to in a minute. Um, a sizable fraction, uh, though, of illicit opioid users start with prescription opioids, but another fact I want to come back to, not ones that they were necessarily prescribed directly. So that's going to be sort of important kind of in the, the story here. The second thing is, and I'll show you some evidence of this, there's wide geographic uh, variation in sort of where uh, opioid deaths are, are concentrated. West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania have very, very high uh, uh, opioid uh, death rates. Texas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, very low. Um, and so something's going on uh, kind of with this variation. Um, interestingly, opioids uh, tend to be a, a more East Coast phenomenon generally than a West Coast, something that's not sort of entirely understood uh, as to why, uh, say, heroin addiction is higher in the Northeast than it is, say, in Southern California. So one of the questions is kind of what led to this dramatic uh, uh, increase in opioid mortality. That leads me to kind of the CMC angle of this, which is um, uh, since uh, 2004, um, I have had an affiliation with an outfit called the RAND Institute for Civil Justice. Uh, RAND is a think tank in Santa Monica, and one of their divisions actually studies um, uh, civil justice. Um, uh, actually, Judge Cool, uh, who uh, is uh, uh, driving at the moment, is on uh, the board uh, of the RAND ICJ. Um, and we have for a while had a partnership with something that uh, at CMC called the CMC Policy Lab that Zach Corser and I founded together. Um, just a little bit on the CMC Policy Lab, and then I want to come back uh, and talk about this in a bit. The CMC Policy Lab is an attempt that um, uh, is a program we put together to basically allow CMC students to work on a, uh, a public policy project with a think tank. And the, the idea behind this is that you get some uh, experience in working with uh, public policy questions. And one of the things about this is uh, you get experience doing that where we don't know the answers. And as I've uh, pointed out pretty regularly uh, to students, most of the time when you're a student and you're assigned a question, uh, the faculty member actually knows the answer to that question, right? Um, I give students econ homeworks uh, uh, in intro econ and, and I do actually, contrary to popular belief, know what the answers to those questions are. Uh, and, and then the students sort of work them out. But of course, in the policy lab, we don't know that. Um, we've got several policy lab uh, alums on the Zoom call. Uh, uh, Melanie, uh, um, Alec, and others uh, have sort of worked uh, for the CMC policy lab. The three partnerships we've got going on right now are one with CRU, Citizens for Responsible, uh, uh, Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. Uh, that project's looking at payday lending. Uh, we have another pro project uh, with R the R Street Institute that's looking at earmark reform. Uh, and then we have this project that is an offshoot of a project on multi-district litigation. And I'll talk more about sort of what that is in a minute. Um, one of the things we did uh, um, this summer when a lot of internship opportunities uh, went up in smoke for students was we went back to our, our principal funder, uh, the foundation that uh, has been um, uh, funding the Policy Lab, and we said we'd like to reallocate funds and we'd like to run a summer program where we work on these projects and we have a number of students. So um, that's what we did. That's the Policy Lab Summer Associates Program. And that's kind of what uh, this research uh, that I'm talking about today is coming out of. So, so let me just go for a couple big questions for a moment. Um, the first big question uh, is, 
is this opioid MDL a public health response? Um, you know, if, if you're involved in an auto accident, um, there's a reason there might be litigation. Uh, uh, Evan, since you're at the top of the queue, you and I are going to be involved in an auto accident. Uh, and if Evan sues me for sort of my reckless driving, we wouldn't say, you know, that's not necessarily regulation of driving per se. It's, it's if I was reckless and oh, Evan is entitled to recovery. Um, so one question might be, maybe this is just a lawsuit. Maybe this is just people sort of recovering damages. Um, maybe this is not really a public health response at all. Um, and then the second question, and this is sort of the bigger question, and sadly, I will not answer this question today, and I probably won't answer this question uh, uh, when the, uh, the research is completed, but, you know, is the civil justice system a good way to deal with public health issues? And there's been a long debate over uh, asbestos and tobacco litigation, um, you know, now for probably 30 years, uh, and you could sort of name others where to say, look, you know, is this the best way to sort of deal with the injuries over a, a public health crisis is running that through the legal system? So that's kind of the, the, the big questions, so to speak. Um, just to give you an idea of the New York Times opinion on this, um, this is a New York Times article from 2018. This is Judge uh, Poster who's handling the opioid MDL. And I will, for all of you who are not lawyers, uh, explain what an MDL is in one second. Um, but basically the New York Times is pretty upfront about this. Can this judge solve the opioid crisis? Uh, and the question basically is, is this litigation going to take care of this other pandemic? And the article is sort of a discussion of, of you know, sort of what this litigation is doing, uh, circa 2018. So this is just my agenda. I want to go over the litigation, what its goals and theories are. I want to go over the public health impact of opioids a little bit. And then I want to just talk a little bit about sort of litigation and its limits. And then I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, Policy Lab Summer Associates Program and kind of what the students in my team uh, uh, that uh, Melanie and James are, are, uh, are managing, uh, what we're sort of up to. So uh, with that, let me talk about scope, parties, and theories. Okay, so here's the first is, um, uh, this is the opioid MDL is MDL 2804. So what is an MDL? So an MDL is a multi-district litigation. So, so the way this arose, imagine sort of back in the 60s, there is an airplane crash. Uh, and, and because Evan is just going to be my victim du jour, uh, uh, Evan and I both die in this airplane crash, sorry. Um, and, and basically our, uh, our respective uh, uh, spouses sue to recover. Now, Evan's younger than I am, uh, uh, so his spouse is probably entitled to sort of more money because there was a longer life expectancy and so on. So we don't really have a common claim of action, but say 150 people died in this terrible plane crash. Well, in that situation, a lot of the discovery motions and kind of the basics of the litigation, all of that is going to be the same for Evan in my case. So there was an idea early on that let's just take all of these things like plane crashes and and uh, and train accidents and things like this, where everyone's going to want to de uh, depose the chairman of the company and so on, and we'll move those into one court. We'll handle all of the, the procedural uh, motions, and then we'll send those back, and we'll let uh, Evan's family have their trial, and my family will have my trial. Uh, in practice, often these cases settle, but that's true sort of of all civil litigation. Um, that has changed. Uh, basically, uh, MDLs now are an extremely important part of both the state and local docket. In fact, uh, uh, Judge Cool on the call is actually um, uh, part of the uh, um, California uh, complex litigation that, that does something similar for sort of state court cases. And so what they do is they try to basically take a lot of these claims for some common cause, bind them together and basically make them manageable for the courts. And that's what they've done with all of these opioid lawsuits in 2017. Um, right now, it's actually a uh, new count. It's about 2,800 claims, and they've all been centered in the Northern District of Ohio, and Judge Polster is, uh, is the, the judge in charge, and trials have begun about 2019. They've now been postponed due to COVID. Okay, one thing that's a little different about this uh, litigation is it's a really diverse group. So in, in my hypothetical example of Evan and my terrible fate in a plane crash, right, uh, in that situation, um, you know, there would be uh, uh, just people who were on the plane, right? Uh, they would have a common injury. Um, another MDL I've studied uh, involved hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women. Um, you know, uh, that was uh, basically women who had developed breast cancer. Um, and so the causes of action were sort of really similar. 
Um, this one is not like that. It has individuals, hospitals, insurers, state attorneys general, local and tribal governments. Um, and many of these harms are communities, often counties, saying, look, this is the damage caused by opioids in our community. So this is the cost of, of educating uh, children whose parents uh, have an opioid addiction. It's the cost of policing. So it's much broader than kind of the, the original Evan and I uh, uh, basically both die and we're recovering damages. Um, the other thing that's broader is it involves a broad class of defendants that are sort of not uh, uh, exactly the same, right? And so ordinarily what would happen is Evan and I would sue the airplane company uh, for, uh, uh, for the crash. But uh, if it was a, a drug, we would sue the pharmaceutical companies. But this one involves, for reasons I'll talk about, a lot of different uh, entities, right? It involves pharmaceutical manufacturers, distributors, uh, retailers, benefits managers, and, and a lot of that has to do with the theory of the case. Just to give you a sense of kind of what it looks like, it's primarily a county and city uh, litigation, but uh, not entirely. Um, Native American tribes have been brought into this, unions that provide health benefits. Um, all of the states, uh, and I can talk about this more if anybody's interested, uh, but one are sort of involved in this, but they're kind of silent partners for reasons we can sort of talk about. Um, the second thing is that the, the filings have continued uh, apace. And so this is just a, the bar is the number of new additions to the opioid MDL. And what you can see is from the time it was uh, initially, uh, initially started, um, you just have had a, a ton of cases kind of being added. The other thing about this, and this is a little small, so I apologize for the tiny uh, graphic on the right. But the other thing to note is very few of the entities other than counties were involved in the litigation at the beginning. So you'll notice Native American tribes uh, get added after the creation of the MDL. Um, in part, that's because they felt their cause of action was different uh, than the counties and they didn't wanna be part of it. So there's been a, a kind of putting uh, a lot of different groups together and you can kind of see that in the data we've collected. So what are the allegations? So, so I think, Broadly speaking, for sort of, and, and any lawyers on the call will immediately take issue with my characterization of this, um, but you're all on mute, so uh, uh, you're stuck. But, um, but the story here is, I would say there's kind of four uh, broad claims. One would be a marketing scheme, right? That essentially the manufacturers of prescription opioids basically uh, diminished the risk of addiction. So that, that they, they, in order to sort of sell more pills, they basically made this seem as if it was not as dangerous as it actually was. The second allegation is broadly a supply chain scheme, right? The, the idea is, look, um, at one point, I forget the exact number, but it was something like 10 pills being sold for every resident of West Virginia. Um, and the idea is like, look, if you are a distributor, you have to know that that is a crazy amount of opioids and you have to begin to think maybe these are being illegally used. And so that's a problem. So that's another allegation. A third allegation uh, is racketeering, which, you know, usually gets used against organized crime, but it's basically the argument that, you know, this is an ongoing criminal activity. You, you know, the, the companies involved knew that, uh, that this was the case. And then a lot of these claims, as we'll see, are, are straight up negligence. It's back to, to Evan and my car accident, right? That there was a duty to warn here. Uh, individuals weren't warned, and so uh, they were injured by prescription opioids. Um, this is just a breakdown um, um, from some data that uh, uh, Mel and her team have been collecting. Um, and basically, uh, this shows we've been going through the complaints. Um, so we've gotten through uh, 205, and, and uh, we might be now even up to about 250, where uh, we're, and by we, I mean they, are reading the complaints and going through and seeing what people uh, are alleging in these. And, and what you can see is kind of those ones I just mentioned are kind of at the top of the allegations list. That tends to be what uh, people are suing over. Okay, so let's talk about opioids and kind of what's happened with them. So here's the, this is basically the opioid overdose death rate starting in 1999. And the thing I want you to notice about this is that um, heroin and synthetic uh, opioids are, are on a, a steady increase, um, uh, really starting throughout the aughts. And this just kind of keeps going uh, all throughout the, the 2000s. The second thing I want you to notice is um, that synthetic opioids have really sort of taken off. And this is, this is kind of the big problem got us automatically loaded, loaded in. in this market, right? And the, the big problem in this market is that uh, is fentanyl. Uh, if you don't know what fentanyl is, it's a synthetic opioid that's extremely potent 
uh, it was primarily uh, is primarily used for people uh, after major surgery uh, uh, to sort of deal with with really severe pain. And it's very very carefully monitored because it's very very easy to overdose. Uh, it is now being apparently cut in with uh, heroin, and so a lot of this rise in death is people who are basically getting. Uh, heroin that they they either don't realize or don't care is is laced with fentanyl. So the 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 big increase in deaths is due to this uh, this synthetic opioid uh, uh, basically being used illegally and cut in with sort of other opioids. The second thing is to just look at sales deaths and sort of treatment admissions. Uh, this one I only have data up to 2010, but again you see the same broad trend, right? Um, uh, sales of opioids are sort of rising all through the aughts. Uh, at the same time, deaths are sort of rising uh, as are sort of admissions to sort of treatment. So, so something is going on uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, kind of the opioids that, that really begins to kind of back up that this might be a big component of the uh, deaths of despair. Okay, so here's an issue that, that we'll come back to in a minute, but basically about half of the illegal opioid users uh, who are abusing pills get a pill from a friend. Um, only about 21% of the, the opioid users uh, in these surveys get the pill from their doctor. So, so what that means is Eric Helland uh, uh, is, uh, begins uh, abusing uh, uh, opioids, and it's quite likely that what happened was he got it um, from his friend. This one, Evan, I will not implicate you. Uh, but the, uh, the story basically then is that he's not been prescribed this. It's, he's not under a doctor's care. Uh, he's, he's doing something uh, illegal. The, the, the problem, of course, is that about uh, half of those pills, right, uh, sorry, about 83% of those pills actually come from a doctor. And so the idea would be Eric's getting these from his friend. They were prescribed legally uh, to his friend, uh, and then he's uh, sort of taking the, the excess. So one of the things that's going on here is that a lot of the people who are abusing these did not necessarily get them uh, through sort of being prescribed. However, the people that they are getting the pills from seem to have uh, gotten these from scripts. And again, not all. Um, the second thing is uh, about four to six percent of those who misuse uh, prescription opioids transition to heroin, which is a, a relatively small number. But the flip side is about 80 percent of the people who use heroin first misused uh, prescription opioids. Um, and about half the patients uh, that had uh, an opioid prescription in uh, the year before they overdosed on heroin, uh, about 11% had an active prescription. So the idea here is, and I just sort of to complete this, right, is, and I'm gonna get to the last point in a second. The idea here basically is a lot of the pills that are being produced by pharmaceutical manufacturers are being, uh, are, are the ones being abused. But a relatively small number of the people who are sort of abusing are people who have been prescribed that medication. And that's going to present a real problem for kind of the traditional uh, pharmaceutical litigation, right? Because uh, again, if, if I'm prescribed a drug, uh, the drug has side effects I was not told about, uh, my doctor didn't know about them, I can sue the drug and say, you know, this was a, 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 an unintended side effect, I was harmed by this drug, and if I can prove that it caused my injury, um, then I can sort of uh, recover. But in this case, if I misuse the drug, if the drug clearly says, you know, Eric, don't take 47 pills at once, and I take 47 pills at once, um, I haven't actually followed the doctor's advice, and I, I, uh, I have a bar to recovery. And so under traditional theories, these would be sort of hard to recover. Um, the second interesting uh, thing on this is, as it became clear in the sort of late aughts that a lot of these pills were being abused, the makers of uh, uh, prescription opioids, particularly Oxy, did a reformulation. Now, just to be a little clear on how this worked, the way this would work is that all of these pills have a time release capsule, which makes them not so great for abusing opioids uh, because you have to, you know, if you even if you take an existing dose, you have to wait a while to sort of get high from them. So what people were doing was they were cutting them up uh, in order to get around the, the time release. So the reformulation did was it actually caused uh, the, if you tried to cut the pill, it turns into kind of a gummy. Basically means you can't, it, it's really difficult to sort of take the pill once you try to chop it up. And what that led to was a pretty dramatic reduction in abuse of prescription opioids. But it also seems to have led to a pretty dramatic increase in the use of heroin. Um, and so one of the other sort of problems with this is that we've now had this transition uh, due to the reformulation. So uh, again, neither good nor bad, but there's some research uh, that uh, was done by some RAND um, 
uh, RAND researchers looking at this shift sort of from uh, uh, for prescription opioids to heroin, which stepped up pretty dramatically after the reformulation, then it was, it was harder to abuse uh, uh, prescription opioids. The other thing to note is we've had a big drop in, uh, in opioid prescriptions. Um, uh, since 2012, uh, uh, doctors have become much uh, stingier in sort of prescribing opioids. Um, but it is worth pointing out that we're still, uh, we're still um, uh, pretty high up on the list of countries uh, in terms of people uh, prescribed opioids. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're kind of an outlier on the amount of prescribing, even if the amount of prescribing has come down pretty dramatically since uh, 2012. Okay, so this map uh, is about the geographic distribution. The, the gray areas are actually where the number of opioid deaths are masked. So in small counties, uh, the, the CDC does not release uh, actually the opioid deaths, but in the larger counties, uh, and so darker regions on this are more opioid deaths uh, per 100,000 people. And you begin to see Southern Ohio, uh, sort of Indiana, West Virginia, Kentucky, um, those are areas that have really got uh, a very high rates of opioid overdoses. Okay, so the next one I want to show you is where the lawsuits are. So this is, uh, this data is preliminary. It's being updated actually right now uh, by Mel and her team. Um, but let me just show you some sort of preliminary uh, findings. So this map uh, um, is basically what counties have joined the lawsuit. And so you'll notice a few things about this that I want to come back to. One is the places that seem to be hardest hit are actually, you know, sort of West Virginia, Southern Ohio, Kentucky, and so on. They're in the litigation. But there's also places that weren't as, uh, as hard hit by that measure. Uh, Wisconsin, for example, almost every county in Wisconsin has joined this. Uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and so on. So one of the things to sort of that we're going to be exploring in this project going forward is, you know, sort of what is the correlation between sort of the harms uh, suffered by um, uh, counties and the likelihood that they join this litigation. Um, and so we're sort of working on that. Uh, uh, we're also collecting uh, sort of state cases now. Um, and if anyone has questions on that, I will hand them off to Mel immediately. Um, so here's my next uh, part, and then I'll, uh, I'll sort of um, wrap up and talk about, take questions and talk about the policy line. So this is basically litigation and public policy. So here's the question. What are the limits of civil litigation as a tool of public policy? And, and here's what I'm getting at, right? Which is, um, we've done a couple of events at RAND talking about uh, opioids, and we've had a very long history at the ICJ of looking at asbestos litigation. And the question comes up a lot, would it be better to, to handle this with public policy? Uh, interesting story, that's actually how I got my start at RAND. I was working uh, uh, in the White House back in uh, 2003, and I was actually on a task force trying to create a no-fault system for sort of asbestos. And uh, uh, the ICJ was actually the source of a lot of information, and that was my initial connection with them. So what are the limits of uh, civil litigation as public policy? Well, the, the first one would be causation, the one we talked about. You have to actually show that uh, in, in sort of traditional theories of sort of litigation, that, uh, that one of the parties uh, um, negligently or uh, owed you a duty of care and didn't provide it. Now, part of what's happened with this litigation is that uh, the, the new claims about public nuisance, about the marketing strategies, uh, about uh, the um, uh, failure to monitor the distribution networks, those are broader because they're actually saying, no, uh, uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical, you're actually responsible, not just for someone that was prescribed opioids and became addicted because you didn't warn them how addictive it was, but actually you're responsible for people who illegally used prescription opioids and transitioned onto heroin or something like that. So it's a broader claim that kind of expands the notion of what the, you could receive compensation for in the courts. Um, the second issue with uh, public policy is, you know, the harms, uh, and this is why we're interested in whether the harms line up with uh, uh, the harms line up with who's suing. Um, you know, to recover, you have to be part of the lawsuit. Um, one of the issues uh, would be that you know uh, a lot of the trials are taking place in Ohio. The the verdicts you may have heard are quite large, and and the question is, is that compensation going to sort of the people who were sort of most injured by this? Um, and the answer is, you know, litigation doesn't work that way. Litigation is about the litigants in front of the judge. Um, and so even in an MDL, um, it is, you know, no, no one is taking a step back and saying, well, you know, are, are all of the counties that have been harmed by opioids represented in this? 
they're just taking the plaintiffs that, that have come before the court because um, that's their role. Um, and then the last one is one that Rand has sort of talked about a lot, um, which is the transaction costs. Um, the adversarial system is, is really expensive, right? Um, now, you know, one issue is it might be that, that any other system we come up with is also going to be adversarial and really expensive. But, you know, for asbestos and tobacco, one of the questions is, is, you know, doing this through a system where there's a lot of cost of discovery, lawyers' time, and so on, is that the right system? And, and one of the things we've done in this country uh, is we've moved, for example, workers' compensation out of the tort system uh, and into sort of its own, uh, 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 its own system, where if you're injured at work, uh, if I develop a, a whiteboard allergy, um, I don't have to prove that there was some negligence or some causal claim. I just have to demonstrate that it's a, a workplace injury. And the thought is that cuts down on transaction cost. The last thing, and this one uh, uh, I think is kind of important, uh, is kind of bankruptcy. Look, the story on bankruptcy is that uh, bankruptcy, as it was described by one of the ICJ board members, is kind of rough justice. Um, if, you, if you have a claim on Purdue Pharmaceutical, which is now in bankruptcy, uh, and let's imagine, I'm going to bring Evan back into this, uh, uh, let's say both Evan and I uh, have uh, an asbestos claim. Uh, and so Evan, uh, Evan has been exposed to asbestos, but he's not sick yet. Um, I've been uh, exposed to asbestos and I'm quite ill. Well, both of us then, if the, the manufacturer of asbestos goes bankrupt, we both go before the bankruptcy court and we both are unsecured creditors in the bankruptcy court. And so the, the issue there is that, that the, the trade-off of how much money is available and sort of who gets a compensation, bankruptcy courts, um, that's not really their job. Their job is to kind of get the debts to a manageable level so the company can either be a growing concern or liquidate it. That led, has led to a couple of interesting alternative ways of doing this. One would be black lung uh, benefits, which if you are a minor in this country, uh, and you develop black lung, there is a compensation system available for you that does not go through the tort system. Um, one that we're gonna be hearing a lot about, I suspect soon, is the National uh, Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Uh, this was set up uh, back in the 80s when uh, vaccines looked like they might be, uh, companies would just stop making them because the litigation costs were high relative to the profits. Most of the vaccines were off patent. They weren't particularly lucrative, uh, but occasionally vaccines do go wrong and people are injured by them. And so uh, what Congress did was create essentially a, a program to compensate people injured by vaccines uh, that, that doesn't, um, that comes from a small tax on vaccines. Uh, and then, as I was mentioning, uh, my personal failed attempt to create a no-fault system uh, uh, that I was a part of on asbestos in 2003. And the, the thought I want to just leave you with uh, on, on this point is, you know, right now we're talking a lot about the fact that there are three uh, drugs in clinical trials right now, uh, vaccines for COVID-19. It's probably the, the kind of best chance we have for things sort of getting back to normal. And so one of the questions that got asked over asbestos, and I think it's worth asking now is, you know, is it a good idea to use the bankruptcy courts uh, because that kind of involves everything the corporation is doing, not just the sort of litigation. And so these are all questions that, that ICJ has kind of been wrestling with over years and the CMC Policy Lab uh, is gonna kind of contribute on this one. And as I said, we really won't be able to answer that question, but we'll be able to provide some inputs onto that, right? You know, so what happens to, uh, to companies, uh, to litigants when, uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical goes into bankruptcy and so on. Okay, uh, and then I'm just going to uh, uh, sort of leave off with this uh, last thought and then I'll talk for one second about Policy Lab because I'm kind of going over uh, what I had intended. But, um, you know, the public nuisance theory that this litigation has been brought under um, allows cases that would be hard to prove under sort of older theories of litigation. And I think one interesting question is, you know, where does that go next? Um, so, for example, sugar-sweetened beverages, right? There's a lot of evidence that drinking uh, um, uh, beverages with high fructose corn syrup or lots of sugar uh, actually is a big cause of diabetes and obesity and so on. But, of course, um, everybody knows that, and so it's been very hard uh, for uh, litigants to sort of make a claim uh, over sugar-sweetened beverages. But if you argue that, you know, uh, uh, sugar-sweetened beverage manufacturers uh, engaged in a concerted effort to minimize the health risks of their beverage, would it work under public nuisance theory? Uh, global warming, same story, right? Most of us, I'm, I'm currently 
uh, in an office where there is power uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, a fan is nicely blowing on me, I am both a contributor and a victim uh, of global warming, right? Um, you know, who has standing to bring these, but a public nuisance theory where, uh, say, power companies or fossil fuel companies had minimized the danger um, of, uh, of fossil fuels to global warming, that might, under the public interest theory, have sort of more of a chance. And so one of the questions we're kind of interested in at the ICJ is, you know, what's the next step for this? Where else does this sort of go? Uh, and then, you know, are legislative solutions better? And, and one question that I think always needs to be asked is, um, are legislative uh, solutions on the table? Uh, you know, we live in a highly polarized age in terms of politics, and, uh, and often legislative solutions that sound great on paper sort of uh, uh, can't get passed, and so these things end up uh, in the courts, uh, and so the courts kind of have to do the best they can. Uh, and then I just, because every slide these days should have a COVID-19 question mark on it, uh, um, you know, one of the questions is, you know, what does this mean kind of uh, for, you know, sort of dealing with a lot of the injuries that have resulted from COVID-19? Um, I don't know about that, but it's just an interesting uh, sort of open-ended question about the liability system in COVID-19. So I just want to talk about the Policy Lab for one second. This is the Policy Lab Summer Associates. Um, we currently have uh, 11 CMC students working on this, um, five, uh, uh, one uh, 5C student. Uh, we have four sort of recent graduates working on these projects, uh, uh, one of which is Melanie Wolf. Um, they are collecting organizing data. They're working with Bo Kilmer uh, and Rebecca Hofchi, who are uh, my sort of partners on this uh, at the Rand Corporation. Um, and really what they're doing is they're building a comprehensive data set uh, of uh, kind of this opioid litigation because uh, it turns out it's actually very hard to sort of keep track of this. They're going through and looking at the causes of action. Uh, and then they're really doing a lot of uh, 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 steps at analyzing how the lawsuit trajectory has changed over time, what the relationship is between case filings. Um, they're working on a network analysis, looking at uh, the interconnection between uh, law firms in other pharmaceutical MDLs and the opioid MDLs all the way back to the tobacco litigation. So, uh, so we're, uh, we're in the midst of uh, generating results, which is why I haven't showed you any. Uh, and with that, uh, I will stop uh, sharing my screen uh, and I will point my camera back down and I will take questions. Fantastic. So we have uh, one question from the chat and one question currently uh, with the hand raised. So I'll turn it over to Art Dodd really quickly. Um, Art, go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Yeah, Eric, thank you. Um, I, I'm Art. struck, you're, given your comments about legislative solutions versus courts, if you go back to the time when Ralph Rossum was a dean of faculty and pursuing criminal justice reforms, can you talk a little bit more about the tension between a legislative agenda may get me reelected, but it won't bring a bill to a vote as opposed to seeking some concrete solution through a court system? Yeah, it's an absolutely great point. Um, you know, I mean, if, if you think about the, so let, let me take this in kind of two parts. Let me angle my camera down because it looks like I have an enormous amount of headroom. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the two parts and, and one of the nice things about Policy Lab is it's, a, it's an economist and a political scientist. Professor Corser is a political scientist. So we spend a lot of time talking about kind of different avenues of public policy. And, and you're absolutely right, which is, look, if you're a person, you know, you're a county uh, which has a, you know, a bill coming due sort of on opioids, right? I mean, you can think of a lot of legislative solutions, but those require uh, a lot more time, uh, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of sort of um, uh, horse trading within kind of the legislature. Um, you might have, you know, a couple representatives in Congress if you're sort of a bigger state. Um, if it's not geographic, it's geographically narrow, uh, it may be hard. Um, often states uh, uh, in these cases, you know, our, our West Virginia has been sort of hit particularly hard. So I think that the politics of legislative solutions to this is actually hard, right? Because often the, the damages are quite concentrated and you need something like a threat to vaccines, uh, you know, sort of in the 80s where manufacturers were saying, you know, we're just going to stop making these to kind of get these solutions. I, you know, the, 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 the one that comes to mind for me, I was involved in this 2002-2003 um, attempt to basically have a legislative solution to asbestos. And the, the problem here is that the, the, the issue was that basically uh, insurers and sort of others that were sort of involved in, and would have had to pay for this in part, and the sort of the negotiation within Congress was how much is this going to cost? And it, it basically came uh, apart on nobody being able to really put a price tag on it. 
Uh, and, you know, at the time, the, the House leadership said, you know, we don't want to create an open-ended uh, program that we don't sort of know what it's going to cost. Now, what's interesting about that is, um, you know, the system we were kind of proposing in that is kind of where the courts have ended up. Uh, the courts have, in asbestos, it's a long-running MDL. I don't think it'll ever have a global settlement. Uh, and what has happened is they've moved to a system where, you know, if Evan uh, comes before the, the MDL uh, asbestos uh, uh, judge, there's a compensation he would get for sort of one injury. I would get another set for injuries and lost wages. So the interesting thing to me is that um, the courts kind of, just because they had all this litigation, kind of ended up. Uh, to a place not dissimilar from where what we were talking about as a legislative solution. So that's a, a long and convoluted answer to a really good question. Um, but I think it's an interesting point is, you know, um, you know, how do people, how do people sort of resolve these issues when uh, the legislative process just takes a ton of time? Thank you, Eric. A uh, question from the, uh, the chat came in from Phil from DC. He'd like to know when either A, uh, years or within a range of years, the opioid crisis as we recognize it arrived to full public consciousness. So five years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm an economist, uh, which means, of course, I have to say it depends, um, uh, which is a little unfair. But the, uh, um, I would say probably within the last, you know, sort of 10 years, there was a, a round of litigation uh, kind of in the late, uh, late aughts uh, sort of around this, um, but not by the counties. So I think in some sense, uh, end of the aughts, uh, this had started coming up on sort of people's consciousness. What's interesting is that in certain places like West Virginia, Ohio, and so on, uh, you were getting a, a, a lot of discussions of this sort of much earlier. Uh, and so I think one of the interesting uh, questions that, that hasn't been satisfactorily answered by me or sort of anyone else is, you know, why in these particular areas, uh, Kentucky, uh, sort of uh, West Virginia, Southern Ohio, uh, Southern Indiana, why did these places, why did it start earlier? Why was it sort of more severe? Um, and, and it was kind of, you know, it was on the consciousness of policymakers at the state level, sort of early on. Um, I would say national consciousness, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, mid uh, 2012, 13, 15, something like that. But the interesting thing to me is that much earlier, uh, you started to get uh, places like Ohio and so on, where uh, you started to have sort of real problems with this. And I don't have a good sense of sort of why that is. All right, next we have Adrian Joe. Adrian, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Adrian, class. Hi, Adrian. Um, so right now I'm currently in a PhD program studying neuropharmacology. So um, I'm very interested in drugs in the brain and just addiction in general. And so here at Penn, a lot of scientists are studying the neurobiology and behavior of opioid abuse and rodent models and figuring out, okay, in the brain, what happens from initial drug exposure and how does this develop into chronic drug use and then addiction, as well as how can we genetically modify certain genes to figure out which ones are involved in opioid exposure. So overall, there's just a lot of cool stuff happening scientifically, but it kind of seems like scientists and public policymakers are like in completely separate domains. So I was just wondering how you think individuals in public policy and scientists should collaborate together to, um, yeah, I guess just kind of tackle this issue. This is such a good question. Um, thank you. Um, so, you know, let me actually wind it back a little bit, which is, um, and you're, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because the pharmacology of this is, uh, uh, is let's just say my weak. Uh, my weak spot on this, but my sense from my co-authors is that there was an emerging uh, sort of evidence in the 2000s about this genetic component that you're sort of mentioning that there are people for whom uh, that are just less likely to get sort of addicted to opioids, people who are just much more likely to get addicted to opioids. What's interesting is at exactly that point, that the pharmaceutical companies, particularly sort of Purdue and others, were arguing um, uh, that this was sort of much less addictive. And there was another group of physicians arguing that chronic pain was something that should be treated sort of much more aggressively. And so one of the interesting things that I don't have a sort of great answer for, but it appears that the physicians sort of looking uh, that were sort of arguing for sort of more aggressive treatment of, of pain 
right, that those people sort of got listened to and there was a, a sort of a, a feeling that doctors should sort of prescribe more opioids, the, the, the um, level of scrutiny around opioid prescriptions have diminished. Exactly at the same point that, that it was beginning to be clear that there was a, a group of people who were very, very susceptible to this and sort of the pharmacology uh, uh, studies was that, that there was a genetic component to this, much like alcoholism and other uh, sort of abuses. So I, this is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I, I think you're at some point going to have to sort of have some organization like the FDA sort of involved in these because um, courts, by their very nature, they're going to have experts testifying but it's going to be at a static point in time, that evolving nature of science, a judgment just has to occur at a certain point, And then it's going to sort of over time, uh, that that judgment will sort of play out. So I, I think in some sense, your question is a really good one, which is how do we put in place something so that um, uh, new science can kind of be brought uh, to bear on this? Because I think what that would say is that you know, you want to be very careful. You want to monitor people much more closely because until there's a genetic test, you don't know if you're dealing with someone for whom, you know, a, a knee surgery with a very small number of pills could, you know, sort of lead to an addiction. Um, you know, one of the things that was going on uh, so early on, a lot of those pills I was describing that were um, uh, ones prescribed that people were getting from friends were that they were just prescribing a lot of pills. You know, you don't need to come back to, uh, you know, you have your knee surgery. Why don't we just prescribe you a, a bunch of pills so you don't have to come back uh, to the doctor and get your prescription refilled. And if you don't need them, just, you know, flush them. Right. And, and it's pretty clear that was a, you know, one, a mistake because, you know, people gave them to their friends, but two, probably really a mistake given that there's a group of people who, uh, are sort of much more likely to become addicted and you've now given them a longer supply without sort of the ability to monitor them. So that's a, a, a long answer to a really good question, but it, I think, you know, so, some way in which, the, 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 let me give you one last thing on this just to sort of think about. The, the, there's a, a process in the FDA uh, that deals with the warning labels, uh, and I've got another project sort of studying that and looking at how those warning labels update. And, and I will say one of the issues is it's it's uh, that process kind of probably by necessity is is very cumbersome. It takes a long time to bring new information in and change a warning label. I don't think it could be any way other than that, um, right? You know that that is you know you wouldn't want every new study to result in an instant change in sort of the warning label. That's not the way science works. But I guess that's just a long way of saying I don't want to be too hard on the courts in that. I think the regulatory process also uh, has a lot of delays to it. Uh, it has a lot of actors and kind of the arts question from sort of earlier, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have situations where, um, you know, the, the regulatory process might even be slower than the courts. And so new information about harms might come to the public attention faster through litigation uh, because someone realizes that there is this harm. Uh, it has a genetic component and, uh, you know, doctors were not sort of taking that into account even when it was readily available. So, yeah, it's a really good question. Cool. Thank you so and much. Good luck with your studies, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Alec from Chicago, go ahead. Hey, so I, I promised hey. another question. So uh, <laughs> you doing, I want to put you, I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, I want to put you in a little bit of a tough spot here and ask you to make sort of a prediction. So I can't hear you. What? What? Oh. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so I see, it seems like there's a decent number of parallels between uh, these set of lawsuits and the tobacco lawsuits and the subsequent settlements that had a pretty nice boost in funding for state and local governments. And so I'm curious, like, should be should governments be expecting something similar as, as the result of these lawsuits? Is there like, is it going to be harder because of so many different parties being involved that aren't government? How, how is this going to get resolved? Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, the, the, so the, sure, let me go back to one thing you just said earlier. If, if you talk to um, county government, uh, cities and so on, they don't have quite as rosy a picture of the tobacco legislation. They feel like they didn't get uh, yeah, particularly, uh, level, yeah. so, so that a lot of that went into sort of state level programs. The, the part of what was going on there was under the, the old theory right, that you had a pretty good claim for tobacco because you could say we pay Medicare uh, costs, smoking generates this harm, that's paid at the state level, uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we'll add some of these county level harms for sort of care that wasn't sort of compensated or something like that related to tobacco, um, and we'll sort of pay people that. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is broader. So I think it's going to be very, very, if, if I, I'll, I'll crawl out on my uh, 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 prediction limb, which is never a good place to be as an economist. Um, but I think it's going to be much harder to resolve this one because you're not dealing with sort of a group of attorneys general. You're not dealing with, you're, you're dealing with a really wide and sort of disparate group of harms. And I, I think it's going to be difficult to kind of get that, that global peace. And, you know, if you look at the sort of the damages being alleged, there's not enough money there. Right. The, the harms are far greater than, you know, if you sort of liquidated the companies and just sort of turned all of the money over. Now, it's always that way in the tort system. So I, I don't mean that to be uh, uh, that that there won't be sort of compensation, but these harms are really, really large. And, you know, the, the, the at some point, you know, there'll have to be some sort of global settlement or it'll settle into something like the asbestos litigation where uh, kind of the harms are just compensated for a long time. But I I think it really does complicate things immensely to have. Uh, to not have, you know, whatever it was, 48 or whatever uh, uh, different parties to this with at least what seems like now a pretty clearly defined harm. Um, and I think that's going to make it difficult to kind of wrangle uh, sort of how this works because it is, it is so broad ranging. And it, I think it's a, it's a big issue. I mean, a lot of these uh, state and local governments have been hit very, very hard. This is, uh, you know, this is a, a difficult thing and they're not you know, the, the fact that you're in a county in West Virginia where, you know, you have very high unemployment, um, you know, the, the, the industries have, uh, you know, largely closed down or it's mono industry, it's sort of a mine. Um, and you have, you know, these, these really, really high harms to, you know, your school system, your police, um, you know, kind of uh, ho your hospital systems dealing with a lot of indigent care. Um, and it's going to be very tough, right? Because it's not clear, you know, that county can't really deal with that from sort of its tax base. So, you know, as a, as a state and local expert uh, yourself, it's, you know, this is a tough one, right? Because, yeah. you know, those, those inter-county, those interstate transfers or even transfers across national boundary, I'm sorry, national boundaries, but uh, across state boundaries, that's a lot of how we deal with these problems, right? Um, and and I, I think maybe the last one to say on this, and, and you know a lot about this, right, is, um, you know, part of this is, um, you know, the way these uh, sort of dealt with in the past is kind of honestly people left, right, that, that you know, that when you had these uh, sort of regions that were really, really heavily depressed, um, and for reasons, you know, we can go into uh, if anybody's interested, but we've made it much more difficult in the United States to move. Uh, and so, you know, you have the added problem that a lot of people are who might otherwise kind of leave these uh, sort of depressed areas and go to, you know, Chicago or something like that, or finding them sort of price, selves priced out of a very expensive housing market where their productivity would be much higher. So I think you couple this with, you know, people who don't have a, a lot of exit options, finding themselves in counties with really, really Otherwise high you have to raise your hand. Yeah. So. Thanks. I think, uh, uh, well, good answer to a tough question. Thank you. I, pre I appreciate the tough questions and I miss you. Miss you <laughs> oh, this, is, this is Bill Heiberger. Can Go you ahead, hear me? Bill. Yeah. Go ahead, um, Bill. Picking up on your comment, Eric, that it's become harder to move in this country. I am sort of thunderstruck to hear it, but I'm sure there's an empirical basis for it. Uh, educate me how it is that we've tethered people to their homes so, and resisted uh, tendency to mobility. We used to be a quite mobile society. It's a great, it's a great, uh, um, it's a great question. So here's the, here's the source. Um, so basically my, my source on this is uh, Brookings uh, and um, uh, in particular, blanking on his name at Harvard, um, Glazier. Um, and so, so here's basically what's been going on for a while. The, the history of that mobility you're describing, and, and the U.S. had very, very high mobility. People sort of moved uh, a lot uh, in kind of the history of this, and uh, they moved to places where there was high productivity. And so the Glazier uh, and co-authors and the people at Brookings have been looking at this and saying, well, one of the weird things that's happening is mobility is declining, but even more than that, mobility is declining faster in people who historically would have had a much greater uh, gain in productivity. So the, the idea is if you're, a, just to give an example, if you're a uh, Uber driver in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, versus an Uber driver in San Francisco, I think Glazer's estimate is something like your income would be something like three to five times higher in San Francisco. Well, the reason Glazer gives for the, so that lack of mobility is that we have zoned people out of those areas. And so the housing costs are even higher in the high productivity areas. So if you, if you, if you looked at this and said, you know, my chances are, don't look very good in, uh, in, you know, um, Harlan County, Kentucky, uh, to sort of uh, pick on uh, uh, an old TV show. I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to, uh, to Chicago, where, you know, even if I work construction or uh, drive a car, my productivity will be sort of higher. And so 
what what Glazier alleges is that what's happened is that we've tied mobility to sort of high productivity uh, uh, jobs actually to education. And so the idea is that what happens now is, you know, people come from, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, areas, uh, they go to colleges uh, that are, are um, fairly selective, and then they're able to sort of use that to sort of move into sort of urban areas. And so the, the theory um, kind of on the desk of despair is that sort of the places that are left behind have, you know, sort of even less, uh, you know, sort of industry than they did. They have even higher cost of the opioid epidemic. They become kind of less attractive places to locate businesses. And at the same time, we've made it very difficult for people to leave. So I, I think the kind of the, the Glazier story on this is it's, it's zoning, um, that because we've made it so difficult to make uh, housing denser, which was kind of our usual approach to people moving into places like New York City, uh, what we've done is basically meet, you know, leave people in sort of low productivity areas um, uh, particularly those people who can't command uh, a sort of really high wage because of a college education or sort of a technical skill. I don't know, does that answer your question, Bill? Thank you, yes. Great, thank you, Bill, for the question. Eric, uh, Professor Helen, thank you so much. The hour is up, it's 3 p.m. Uh, thank you for the time. I know you uh, went into the office for this, so really Oh, this was, this was great, thank you. Um, I, uh, fun, to be, fun to be back in the classroom virtually. <laughs> Good, good, good. I put in the chat, if anybody wants to learn more about the Policy Lab, uh, go to policylab.cmc.edu. You can see what everyone's working on. Uh, and of course, uh, Professor Helen, anything else about the Policy Lab you want to share? How yeah, I just, um, you know, uh, if anybody, maybe I'll just say this, if anybody has any questions on the Policy Lab, uh, please uh, feel free to sort of email me. I'm sort of happy to discuss it. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll just sing its praises in that, uh, and I can see Alex smiling, so that's a good thing, and I, I presume Mel's smiling somewhere around here and others. Um, but it's a really nice uh, program to sort of get people kind of involved. It sort of supplements the CMC Institute uh, uh, Institutes and a lot of the other research avenues that we've sort of got on campus. And so, um, yeah, please check it out. Uh, uh, sing its praises uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, CMC students or other students at the five Cs. We, we'd love to get them involved. Right. And with that, I'm going to unmute everyone. You can feel free to say hello, say thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day or your weekend. Uh, stay safe, everyone. And we would look forward to seeing you next week. We have talks with uh, Jennifer Sandoval Dance from the Office of Admission uh, and a lot more exciting programming coming up. So, hi, everyone. You're unmuted. Thanks for <laughs> hey, coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have thank a good you. weekend. Hey, thank you.